session one of Dune Club 2. Today, we are talking about pages 1 through 48 in this green hardcover edition of the book. Uh, I just want to let you guys know that Dune has no chapter numbers. This entire series, there are no chapter numbers. So if you have a different version of the book, you may have different page numbering. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and let you know what the last words are from the last uh, chapter that we're reading today. The last words that you should have stopped on are, not you, he said. Oh, not you. So that's where we that's where we ended for this session. So for those of you who are in a different edition of the book, there you go. Um, so yay, I'm so excited to see all of you guys back here. Uh, that's really awesome. Uh, I can't believe that we're doing Dune Club 2. Last year, we read Dune together over, uh, gosh, like 12 weeks, I believe, 12 weeks. And uh, it was such a magical experience. It was so much fun. And I'm really excited that we get to go uh, back to Arrakis together. We're going to go back to Arrakis and read the second book in the series. Now, I want to start off by saying that, uh, you know, I, I've been kind of doing this thing where it's like, come get sad with me on a desert planet. And like, this is I, like, like, let's be real about it. This is a sad book. Okay, this is a sad book. But that's okay. It's okay to be sad. And I think it's important to be sad sometimes and, and do that sort of stuff. And uh, a lot of people are not excited about this book. <laughs> like, there's a lot of people in Dune fandom that are like, I read the first book, did not like the second book, or I didn't want to read the second book. And I understand that because uh, they're not hard enough for Dune Club, apparently. There's a lot of people who aren't hard enough for this process. And, you know, it's really fun and easy to watch Paul win the Imperium and crown himself Emperor. You know, it's, it's oh, what a rush. I mean, it's such a high. I mean, this character is just on he's built up the highest he could be built up and then in this book you know what goes up must come down you know and so now we get the fall paul's fall and a lot of people don't like to read that because it is sad you know nobody wants to see their hero uh go through some real shit you know and but you know i'm but the thing is is like i do you know i consider myself i consider myself a real a real true friend uh, to the Atreides family. I am ride or die, and I'm going to be there for Paul when things are tough. I'm not going to be there just when things are great. I also want to, I want to see what happens, you know, I want to see where this all leads. So, you know, while I understand a lot of people are, this isn't their favorite, and it's not the most fun book to read in the series, I'll tell you that. It's probably the least fun book to read, but that doesn't make it any less important. That doesn't make it uh, any less, uh, you're not going to, I mean, you're going to learn so much from this. We're, I mean, I'm already learning so much from this, like rereading it. Um, I first read this a few, few. I don't even know how many years ago I first read this. But this year, earlier this year, I reread it. And then I've been rereading it again uh, over the past few weeks, this first session, and uh, writing my, my outline and everything. And man, I've already found so much new stuff you know and I, I really love doing this with you guys because you guys give me a reason to really get into this and really take a hard look at it and really try to dissect it and pick it apart um, which is something I love to do is to take dense uh, fiction and art that I, I believe is alchemical and spiritual and uh, really really look at it you know really get in there so I got to get, a, get in under the hood on, uh, on Dune Messiah I'm going to give a few more minutes before we get started. Uh, I want to thank everyone who, uh, for all the kind words that I've received. We premiered our uh, la final episode of the Comic Book Girl Named Teen Show a couple days ago. Uh, we premiered it live here on Twitch, and then we released it on YouTube yesterday. And uh, you guys have been, uh, the support that you guys have been showing us is, is really overwhelming. So thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you to everybody who has subscribed to me on Twitch today. I see so many new subscribers. Thank you so much. By the way, if you have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe for free. You get one free Prime subscription every month. So you could potentially use that and subscribe for free. Uh, and so thank you, everybody, who has been subscribing. And also thanks to all the new uh, Team 19 members on Patreon. A lot of you guys have also chosen to support me on Patreon. Uh, that is also super awesome. We have so many new Team 19 members, so thank you guys so much. Uh, I know this is, an, this is an awkward time for all of us. My YouTube channel is in limbo. Uh, I really, I really do feel 
like uh, you know that, that story of Abraham where it's like God tells him to sacrifice his son on the mountain and he, and he doesn't want to do it but he feels like he has to like God's told him to do this and so he's got to do what he's got to do even though he doesn't want to do it and he takes his son Isaac up there and he's getting ready to, if he's got the fucking knife you know and and then God's like, wait a minute, never, never mind, don't do it. I was just, I was just testing you. It was just a fucking test. You're crazy. You're so crazy, Abraham. You're, you're the crazy. And so I feel like that's kind of what happened to me. It's just like I was already kind of had gone through a lot of um, the emotional labor of uh, making this really, really hard decision. And then uh, literally the second day that we're shooting, all these VidCon announcements happen and. So it's like, ah, oh, you know, I feel, again, it's also, I feel like Godfather 3, you know, every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in, you know, I mean, pull it back in. So, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know where it's going. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. We're still kind of trying to figure it out. You know, we, we're evolving as we move forward. We can't really afford to stop. <laughs> um, so we're just going to, we're just going to keep going. But you know, if a lot of you out there, you know, I mean, I know that times are tough for all of us. So, you know, if you can't financially support us, like, I mean, just tell your friends about the show. Tell your friends about what we're doing. Uh, you know, tell people that's always really cool. That's a huge help. That's like the best because, you know, YouTube's not going to tell anybody about my videos. So it's like you, we, we all have to do it. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I'm sure like if if things turn out and it looks like we're gonna, we can make it work on YouTube, then there is still gonna be some some pivoting and some shifting of the show. It will come back kind of in a in a different form, but we're still figuring out like what that's gonna look like. But so. Definitely, the support allows us to do things we haven't been able to do before. Yes, yes. T Bone says the support allows us to do things that we we haven't been able to do before because um, you know a lot of YouTubers out there, a lot of them it's like it's just them, you know, with just a background and like that's it them on a wall and uh, our production values are a little bit higher <laughs> than your average youtuber our production values are pretty high i mean we've, we've got mad puppets going on here you don't even know what we had to what i had to go through to get those puppet shots for that final episode we built an entire false floor uh and then i had to be under the floor and then i had we had the, we cut these holes where i could put my hands through so I had these two sock puppets, and I'm like laying on the floor like this, like trying to puppet these trolls. Um, and, and, doing it, the voice under. and doing the voice, yeah. They, we also set up a mic under there so I could do the voice while I'm, you know. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I like doing the trolls' voices; no, they're really fun. Know that your voice is the troll. I know. I don't. Yeah, probably a lot of people don't know that. Uh, yeah, that, that's me. That's me. I do the. I do the trolls. Those are my. Those are my little babies. I also made those trolls. Uh, I made them out of. <laughs> socks and uh, felt and baby doll bodies and some like foam uh, to create their heads so uh, so yeah yeah so, you know what saying? They didn't know it was your voice. yeah that's totally me it's totally me <laughs> I like doing voices um, She's really good at impressions. yeah I do impressions um, yeah I troll myself uh, so yeah so yeah it's really it's really exciting um, Let's see here. Wow, we've got almost like 500 people here. We've got 464. Uh, I'm going to give it a couple more minutes, see if we can get it up to 500 before we get started here. Yeah, that's the most ever for Doom. Yeah, this is, well, no, no, no. Our first session of the first Doom Club was bonkers, dude. It was like, about, like over a thousand people or something crazy showed up. Like, it was like so nuts. And then like the chat was just like, and you couldn't even read it. And it was just like, we were not prepared for that, like yeah. at all. But we did it <laughs> and we fucking made it work. Um, but yeah, so uh, so thanks to everybody out there for your support and your kind words. You guys have been uh, really awesome about all of this. Um, like I said, this hasn't been easy on us. I mean, this has been kind of going on for a, f a few months. I've, I kind of came to this decision a little while ago and, you know, it takes, you gotta go through the grieving process a little bit. I had to go through a grieving process a little bit before I was even able to shoot something like that because I mean, I just, I still broke down, started crying in the video, but if I had done it any sooner, I would have been just crying the whole fucking time. So uh, I was super sad, <laughs> but you know, who knows? Like maybe, I don't know, you know, there's a universe of possibilities out there. Uh, I'm really excited about doing a lot more stuff on Twitch this summer in the meantime. Uh, and I also, I am, I am a little burned out. So it's like, I, I do need to take a break. And honestly, like Dune Club is like the best thing for me because like, like there's been so many times in my life where I've been in a rut 
uh, emotionally or whatever, mentally, I'm just like, Ugh. and uh, I've picked up one of Frank Herbert's books and it has helped me to get out of said rut because it's such a it's such an intellectual emotional spiritual commitment to read like it takes so much to read these books and, and they're so rich i mean this world is so rich and so fascinating and so real that it's able to kind of pull me out of my own bullshit <laughs> and so i can stop having a little pity party for myself and then i just get invested in dune so this is actually perfect timing everything's really lined up like really it's been very synchronous thing there's very synchronous things around me and i mean this is it's so weird like weird shit like this happens to me all the time like i remember there was this one time where i was like finally decided i was gonna like tell some somebody somebody it was bothering me that i had i had never kind of brought up to them that i felt that they owed me apology and it was really like bumming me the fuck out because i don't know i'm a psycho and sometimes i need an apology for things so i can move on and forgive and I, you know, I never, I wasn't able to get a chance to be with this person in a room alone. And I didn't want to do it over the phone. But my friend was like, look, this is eating you up inside. Like, you need to just fuck it, do it over the phone, you know, whatever, because, you know, it's bothering you. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to just do it over the phone. I'm just going to do it over the phone. And then, like, the very next day, you know, that person lets me know that they're coming to my area and that they will be in town the, the next week. And then it was just like, ah, universe, like what? Like every, you know, it's like when I finally, I'm like, fine. Ugh. Then the universe is like, oh, here, here it is. Here's the thing, you know, here it is. And then so I got to talk to them in person about it and it was way better. And I'm so glad it happened that way. So this is like another weird instance of that where I'm just like, what? Like, okay. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> so, oh, we're up to 500. Yay. Yay. We did. Yay. We got it. We got it. We got it. Um, yeah, and it's going to be a little a little bit different for those people who were here last time, my original my original Fatakeen Death Commando Fremen Warriors. Uh, you know, our last Doom Club, we did a, a pre pre-recorded situation and then we would cut to questions and questions and answers. This time around, we're going to do it live. We're doing it live. We're going to do it live. Um, I'm just going to read my outline to you guys do it that way and then uh and then we'll go into the q we'll take a quick break after i'm done with my portion and then we're going to come back and do questions and answers uh, i'm going to start by answering questions from my team team 19 members on patreon uh people i make posts every week to patreon about like hey put your doom club questions here and so uh and a lot of you uh, are on there i've got like 30 something questions i don't i'm not going to take all the questions some of those questions will be answered when i'm reading this so those questions i'm not addressing but i'll be addressing the the team 19 members questions first and then we will open it up to you guys here on twitch so that is the plan let me get a little bit of water here before we get started everybody feeling good everybody excited yeah going to no i'm not going to do the Bene Gesserit dresses this time i'm going to stick with the i'm just going to go with this dune club t-shirt by the way uh you can get one if you look below there's a link it'll take Everybody you to my store they're all wearing a shirt right now. oh yeah well yeah the litany against fear shirt like you guys uh by the way thank you everyone who purchased a dune box uh without you this wouldn't be possible uh you guys have been supporting my life over the past few months <laughs> so thank you uh thank you so much and the litany against fear t-shirt is so sick i'm so glad you guys love it i'm so happy with how it came out uh, matthew skiff is such a fucking phenomenal artist i'm so happy that i got him to uh design that t-shirt for me and work with me on that uh, and that one was a that was a dune box only situation so those are not for sale but we do have these more simple you know basic dune club shirts for people who don't want to wear crazy heavy metal and you can sphere fucking shirts because that was like a really hardcore shirt um, but we also have uh, some of the pins are on sale the dune club two pin we have a couple of atreides crest pins from last dune club i have like 25 of those left although i think i already sold a few of those and uh, we have the Litany Against Fear uh, prayer cards. So those are also available on there. So if you want a signed Litany Against Fear prayer card, you can get one of those. If uh, And when you buy a Doom Club t-shirt, the first 100 orders get a uh, signed Litany Against Fear prayer card with their order. And everyone else, if you order a pen or whatever, you'll get it. Everybody gets the Litany Against Fear. It's not signed, though. It'll be, like, in your package. So if you buy anything. Also, I have a bunch of extra Dune bookmarks from my last Dune Club so those will also be going in the packages so uh so yeah all right guys all right well 
let's get started. Um, here we go. Let's start with an overview. It's been 12 years since Paul Muad'Dib Atreides was crowned emperor of the known universe. In this time, his dreaded Fremen Jihad has spread across the Imperium, killing billions in his royal name, bringing the Federation of Planets to heal, spreading Paul's new religion, and most importantly, shaking up a stagnant gene pool. Now the Bene Gesserit, the Guild, the Carino Princess Irulan, and the Bene Lilacs have come together in a conspiracy to poison Paul's psyche with a gola made from the dead flesh of Duncan Idaho to push the Kwisatz Haderach to suicide. Meanwhile, Paul struggles under the weight of power and responsibility. Disgusted by his religious arm, the Kizarit, and their ongoing jihad, peering into the future, he sees only one way to extinguish the Fremen Crusade. To achieve this peace, it looks as though he must pay a hefty price and willingly make a personal sacrifice that he is not yet prepared to make. Cheney, his concubine and mate, also struggles. Being secretly dosed with a contraceptive by the princess, she has not been able to produce an heir for House Atreides. In the privacy of their royal apartment, apartment Cheney tries and fails to convince her lover to impregnate Irulan. Let's move on to the excerpts from the Death Cell interview with Bronso of Ix. Dune Messiah begins with an interview between the Quizaret and a historian named Bronso of Ix. And this is conducted after some of the events in the book has taken place. Um, this is something that was kind of tripping me out a little bit because I was like trying to figure out where in the timeline this was. Um, it wasn't completely known to me, but it's some time after some of the events in this book have taken place. And this man has written a book titled Analysis of History, Muad'Dib. And in this book, he spills all of the tea, guys. I mean, he spills all of it as seen in the next chapter. Uh, he is just telling the truth, telling it like it is. He's got a, a lot of ideas of how Paul came into the, uh, came to be the emperor and his ideas are right. Uh, and so now he has been captured and is awaiting his death sentence. He's been captured by uh, the religious arm of Paul's empire, the Kizaret. And the thing I love most about this chapter is how it illustrates that things really haven't changed under Paul. Uh, despite Paul being such a hero, uh, having him the best intentions, uh, despite him being this idealized person who would never like want something like this to really be going on, uh, even it's like there are still religious fanatics you know out here putting folks to death for the heresy of uh, discussing truths that they find to be inconvenient to them and there's nothing like paul can really do about it and i mean there's even a point in the chapter where uh bronzo asks does paul does muadib know what you do in these dungeons and the the kizaret priest says you know we do not trouble the holy family with trivia you know so it's like they're doing this all on their own in paul's name uh it's a super fucking bummer and there's really not much he can do about it uh and that's really like what this chapter is for i did see someone in the uh in the questions was saying what was the point of, of this bronzo of ix like what was it and, I, and it's really in my mind it's to illustrate that you know the empire is not perfect under paul people are still being tortured for saying truths like you know like this is like it's it's not <laughs> it's not an idealized empire like you would hope that he would have um and the, also this interview sets us up for a tale of conspiracy to be carried out against paul which begs the question how does one successfully fight a person who can see the future? You know, how does one how does one do that? In our next chapter, we finally get to see uh, we get to read some of the juicy excerpts from the analysis of history Muad'Dib by Bronzo of Ix. This is the book that has earned its author a death sentence, and in it, uh, it conveniently outlines what happened in the last book, Dune. So it serves a dual purpose. You know, it also refreshes us readers' minds uh, and, setting us up, and also setting us up for further events in the book. So, because Dune is so dense, you know, it's so dense. 
And Frank Herbert knows this, and he's like, okay, I don't want to just throw everyone in in the deep end. I want to kind of give everyone a little bit of a refresher because there's so much that happened in the last book, and it's so this is such a complicated story with a lot of moving parts. So he uses this uh, this historian's analysis of history as a way to give us uh, some refresh our memories, and like I said, also set us up for further events in the book. And the thing, uh, Bronson's analysis of history, like, lays it the fuck out. I mean, he talks about Paul being a product of the Penny Cheseret breeding program, which is not something that the sisterhood wants anyone to talk about openly or publish none of that. Uh, but yeah, he talks about how he was a part of their breeding program to produce a quiz at Hatterack that they could control. He talks about how Paul's marriage to Irulan is a sham, you know, which is definitely something like, uh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> like people are like, oh, that's true, but like that's not what everyone, you know. Oh. And he also talks about how Paul captured the Imperium when he captured Arrakis and its monopoly on the spice melange. He accurately is like, yes, like when he took over this planet, that's how he won, you know, and like he's just telling it like it is. But more importantly than all of the uh, the kind of exposition stuff, he writes on a defeat that is to be suffered by Muad'Dib. And this information lets us readers know that we are in for a tragedy. Uh, this is going to be an epic space opera tragedy. You know, that's what we're in for. And um, and we know that our, our hero Paul is in trouble. You know, we know that, that he's got some real shit that he's going to have to contend with in this book. I mean, yeah, he dealt with some real shit last time, but he's got some real shit to deal with this time too. And this time he's not going to win. Yeah, you know, this time there's going to be some defeat. Now, like the Quizats had her, and the thing, another thing that I love about this, I love about, because this, again, like this book was published after some of the events in this book take place. It, I don't believe it was published completely after all of the events had taken place. Um, maybe I'm wrong on this, but... Um, we get to kind of be like the Kwisatz Haderach because we read this and this is from the future, you know, like this is from a future part of the book. And so now we get a sense of the future, just like Paul has a sense of the future. And we know that he is doomed to suffer some sort of defeat, uh, just like Paul understands that he has to suffer some kind of defeat. You know, you can't win all the time. Uh, and what that defeat will look like exactly we don't know you know and uh but we do but what we do know is this there is a conspiracy to be enacted by the obvious plotters the guild the sisterhood and the scientific amoralists the benny lilacs and we also know that there are spies in paul's household uh, that his prescience is being clouded by the dune tarot that he will accept a Gola trained to destroy him, created from the dead flesh of his father's lieutenant and swordmaster, Duncan Idaho. And that within the Kizaret, his own religion, a man named Korba plans to martyr him and lay the blame on Chani. So uh, this chapter also ends with Bronso telling us that none of these factors are the true cause of Paul's defeat, though. And I, I love that. Like, that's the thing. It's like he's he's outlining, like, what's going to go down. And we're like, fuck, Paul is surrounded on all sides by fuckery. I mean, there's just snakes all around him. Uh, you know, I mean, he talks about it later. Like, power comes. The fate of all power is to come under siege. And Paul is absolutely under siege. Um, but Bronzo tells us that, like, none of these factors, yes, they, they contributed to Paul's fall. Uh, that all these things did, in fact, happen. But they're not the true cause. They're not the true culprit. Uh, and instead, he lays the blame on uh, the lethal nature of prophecy and, uh, and how this enormous and far-seeing power is the true culprit behind Paul's fall. Which, how I read that was, uh, this is like Frank Herbert telling us, like, look, like, this book isn't really about some shady conspiracy. You know, yeah, there's a shady conspiracy going on and intrigue and things like that. But... It's really, this book is really about how I built this idealized hero, uh, somebody that we would all willingly follow, and I gave him ultimate power, and now I'm going to show you how this power destroys him, uh, which brings to mind the header of this chapter. Such a rich store of myths enfolds Paul Muad'Dib, the Mentat Emperor, and his sister Alia. 
It is difficult to see the real persons behind these veils, but they were, after all, but there were, after all, a man born Paul Atreides and a woman born Alia. Their flesh was subject to space and time, and even though their oracular powers placed them beyond the usual limits of space and time, they came from human stock. They experienced real events, real events which left real traces upon a real universe. To understand them, it must be seen that their catastrophe was the catastrophe of all mankind. And this work is dedicated then not to Muad'Dib or his sister, but to their heirs, all of us. So buckle up, kiddos. You know, this book really isn't about these fictional characters. This entire work is dedicated to illustrating how power works, how government, religion, economics, all of these things, like what the deal is. Uh, and it talks about how power works yesterday, today, and in the future. Uh, shit doesn't change. And Frank Herbert is just trying to let us know, you know, it's like, and so that's, I read that when he says, you know, uh, their catastrophe was the catastrophe of all mankind. Like these people, these are analogs for like higher ideas that are going on. And this work is dedicated then not to Paul or his sister, but to their heirs, all of us. So it's like, this, this isn't, this isn't about Frank Herbert writing about these characters because he really loves them, even though he does. Uh, it's, it's really about trying to teach us the reader and make us more wise uh, and, and expand our awareness and see how this stuff works um, because it's it's a real thing <laughs> it's a real thing so let's get into our next chapter the conspiracy the conspiracy is finally unveiled in our next chapter we finally get to meet our key conspirators and learn of their plot we see this entire meeting through the perspective of Sightail, the Leiloxu face dancer. And this is our first encounter with the Leiloxu. They weren't even mentioned in the book Dune. Um, they're not, they don't come into play until now, but guess what? You're gonna see the Leiloxu from now until the end of the series. Um, these guys are major players and uh, they are the slippery genetic wizards of the Imperium. Uh, they are amoralists. They're very cold and pragmatic. Much like the sisterhood in the guild, uh, people don't understand how they do what they do. They keep their practices secret. They're very, everyone's very secretive because you have to, that's your power. If nobody knows how you're doing, then they can't take that power away from you and they can't copy it. So um, yeah, and so a face dancer is a Laksu creation. Uh, and so this, this dude's side tail can essentially manipulate his flesh across a wide spectrum of shapes and features as well as put on the psyche of another. He is the perfect mimic spy. And these face dancers openly within the, within the Imperium are used generally as entertainers where of course like these guys would be awesome at, at theater and stuff i mean you know they can play these different roles um they can entertain people by turning into different shapes and mimicking other people but this is really just a cover a front for them uh they're really spies they're really leiloxu spies they're an incredible spice network uh and they are super badass as we see in this chapter um and i love i love that Sightail chose to look like a fat, dumb piece of shit for this meeting. He was like, cause he can choose to look like pretty, like within reason, uh, whatever he wants. Um, I mean, I was I was reading in the uh, Dune Encyclopedia of how, about face dancers and about how all of this works. And, uh, and it was talking about how they have like, they're able, they have these bladders uh, like in, throughout their body that they can kind of like inflate um, and like, so it's like, so the thing is, is like they could look like they're 300 pounds, but they're really gonna be the same weight, but they can like inflate these bladders that like make themselves look fat or small or give them boobs. Uh, they are dudes, they're sterilized dudes. They're sterile, they cannot mate, but um, they're also like kind of hermaphrodi hermaphroditic where um, the, uh, <laughs> the, like when everyone is born, like when everyone's born before they have like a penis or vagina, like everyone kind of has this same kind of weird little genital structure, you know, and then you finally get this specific, uh, you know, the, you get the testosterone or you don't. And so you either it turns into a penis or it turns into a vagina, but midway through turning into uh, a penis, 
they kind of like stop the Laylocks who stop the process so that they still kind of have a hole so they can like make themselves into a female and they can suck up their testicles like inside their bodies and stuff so like he he can like look like a woman if he wants to and have a vagina and even have sex with somebody um so like that's i mean that's like super fucking crazy uh, face dancers are nuts um but yeah anyways i love that he but he chose to look like a fat dumb piece of shit for this meeting because he wants to manipulate his fellow conspirators into us underestimating him uh, because this is a very shaky alliance, you know, like these people do not work well together. They are all at the top of their game. And so, and they're all hungry for power, but they must work together. Normally they would be in competition with one another, but they've been forced by Paul to kind of figure it, figure it out and get together. Uh, we also meet another very alien human. We meet Edric, the guild steersman. He is a full guild navigator and he is swimming around in his orange spice gas tank like the weird man fish that he is he's got webbed hands and feet he is not he eats breathes uh drinks spice melange uh and his presence uh this man's presence man <laughs> this fish man's presence shields them all from paul's awareness because guild navigators because they're on so much spice and they've been mutated they also have the power of prescience not on the level that Paul does, but they do have prescience, and that's how they're able to steer uh, the highliners and, and move without moving, uh, because they, uh, with their prescience, they look through the future to find the safest course, uh, and then have the you know the deal when they drop through the void. It's very it's complicated, uh, but yeah. So he's got it. So if you have prescience, like prescient people can't like really see what other prescient people are doing, um, and so that's why he is uh he's needed at this meeting and we also have two returning characters we have the reverend mother guys helen mohim uh, if you remember she gave paul uh she administered the gumjabar test to him uh and paul you know passed it uh and she may or may not i like to think that she's his grandma but she may or may not be it wasn't ever like facebook official uh in, according to frank herbert and the uh, we also get the Princess Irulan. So she's coming back into play. We got a little bit of her last book as well. Not much with her, but she's back. Uh, and these two women are rounding out our final two conspirators. And so, all right. So we have this shaky alliance between the Bene Gesserit, the Guild, the Leilaxu, and their hoped-for woman on the inside who may or may not be in on all of this. Irulan is still kind of like, you haven't convinced me that this is going to work. Um, they're arguing about how they're going to undo Paul, uh, whether or not Paul is going to find out about this meeting, because, I mean, prescience is poorly understood. They don't know exactly the limits of this power. They're hoping, they think that probably they won't get caught, but that they know that there is a chance. Um, and the, the big chance of them getting caught is if Irulan does not go along with them. Uh, if she does not go along with them, then uh, the, the secrecy, like some of this meeting may come into Paul's awareness. So they're desperately trying to sway her to make a real commitment because if she doesn't, they all might get found out. Fun fact number one, in this chapter, we learn that Irulan has been secretly slipping Chani, Chaney a contraceptive to prevent her from producing an Atreides heir. So that keeps herself in the running. Uh, to be the potential founding mother of a royal dynasty. So, uh, and, and I saw some people asking, well, how come the poison snooper wouldn't find it? And it's like, well, it isn't a poison that she's administering. It's a contraceptive. So the poison snooper is not looking for contraceptives. So that's how she's able to get away with it and slip it in the food uh, or however she's slipping it in there. Uh, fun fact number two, we learned that the Leiloxu have created a Kwisatz Haderach of their own. Uh, some kind of anti-Paul. It's a little vague, but he says something about it, that they created a, a pure villain uh, who ended up choosing to destroy himself rather than to become a hero. Like I said, it's a little vague. And who knows, maybe he's a liar. You know, like maybe he just said that. I don't know. Because uh, the, st the story of this Leilaxu Kwisatz Haderach is never touched on again in the Frank Herbert novels. It may be touched on again in the Brian Herbert stuff. I've not read the Brian Herbert stuff, so... Uh, you know, uh, let me know, <laughs> but uh, it's never touched on again. And I did see some people saying, well, maybe, maybe they were talking about um, uh, 
Fenring. And that's not, Fenring was not what they were talking, Count Fenring from the last book um, was a failed Kwisatz Haderach. And that is, that's not who they're talking about because he was Bene Gesserit. He was produced by the Bene Gesserit um, from their breeding program. Fun fact three. When Duncan Idaho was killed, uh, when he was killed in the first book, trying to protect Paul and his mother and uh, giving them, buying them time so that they could escape, uh, he was killed by the Sardaukar. And his body was preserved for the Leiloxu axolotl tanks by a Sardaukar commander uh, because this guy has mad skills. I mean, he's the best sword fighter in the entire fucking Imperium. I mean, this guy is ultra dangerous and he's also... Uh, has all these skills and, and training and so they're thinking well maybe maybe we can uh, bring this guy back to life uh with the Leiloxu stuff and uh figure some shit out figure something to do with him maybe we could learn from him you know there's like all sorts of all sorts of things but the Sardaukar commander who did this died before he could give the news to Shaddam the fourth and then of course Shaddam the fourth was deposed and then nothing ever came of it but the guild found out about all of this because they transported the body of Duncan Idaho to uh, Laylocks. That's the Laylocks who planted the Laylocks. And, um, and there, the dead was restored uh, and brought back to life as a Gola who has been named Hate and additionally trained as a Mentat. And... Um, yeah, the thing is, is sometimes later on in the book, you know, we get more Gola action. And, like, the, the Leiloxu can create a Gola from just a few cells. I mean, they can clone someone and, and restore their body from just a few cells. But with this, I believe they didn't restore his body. Like, they, they didn't regrow a whole new body. They somehow regrew because he got shot in the head. So they regrew some of this stuff, I guess. And then, like, brought him back and then retrained him. Uh, as, as a mentat, and that has other things that we'll find out about later. Fun fact number four, uh, the Bene Lilacs have a curious code of honor. Their victims must always have a means of escape, and if Paul, so if Paul asks the Gola its purpose, uh, the Gola will respond with the truth that he has been somehow programmed as a weapon against Paul in an effort to destroy him. But the Laylocks, uh, the Laylocks, you guys, high tells like it doesn't matter though. I mean, he can say that all he wants, but like it's it's like he's there to poison Paul's psyche, so that'll even fuck him up, you know. Just even knowing that, you know, it's like that 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 only helps our cause. It doesn't really. It kind of gives him a means of escape, but not totally. Um, and you know, we also too, it's like the Laylocks who here are trying to fuck over all the other conspirators, um, so they can get they can have control uh, over, well, so they can have a quiz that's Hatterack that they can control. Um, so after some wicked back and forth repartee, the conspiracy comes together and it's a multi-point plan. The main play is for the guild to present Paul with the gift of hate. Uh, I love that they named him hate, you know, like they're such trolls, like these guys are such trolls. Uh, the min so, um, and this Mintat Gola, made from Duncan Idaho will throw Alia off her guard because uh, with his sexiness he's going to throw her off her guard with his sexiness he will somehow influence Paul into self-destruction we don't know exactly how that's going to happen but they seem very certain of themselves that they can make this happen and meanwhile you know while that's going on they're also going to stir up trouble for Paul uh, by turning members of the Quizara against him or Kizara against him. And additionally, they're going to try to steal the secret of the melange and destroy the spice monopoly if possible. You know, so they're also going to try for, let's figure out how to make spice on our own planets and like try to make it to where Arrakis isn't the only place. Um, so that's like another part of the plan. And Irulan is convinced after hearing all of this. She's like, okay, game on. You know, as long as like I get to f be the founding mother of a royal dynasty and I have something left to, you know, get me pregnant then like cool I'm in and you know I had so much fun reading this chapter because here you have these four ultra power elites uh, and they are being forced to work together and they're just like stabbing each other with insults it's like you get you get four mean girls you know and you're putting them all together and they all have to work together and they all have their own goals and aims and they're all manipulating each other for their own purposes and uh, and it really cracks me up how like everybody hates Edric like, everyone in the room 
You know, most people, if they ever saw a guild navigator, they'd be like, oh, wow, a guild navigator. But not a reverend mother or this face dancer or Princess Irulan. They're all like, fuck this guy. This guy sucks. Uh, <laughs> it's like really, I loved it when, um, when you know, Edric was like, you better stop talking until I tell you you're able to talk. And then he tries to say something. And guys, Helen Mohim is like, shut up, Edric. I <laughs> just like, shut up. I kept hearing like, shut up, space brain. Like that's, that's what I kept hearing in my in my head it was like poor poor Edric is kind of like a little bit of a space brain uh, and I love how they are using this language that conveys fine emotional subtleties uh, so they're just constantly like talking shit to one another in the most polite way possible sometimes not in a polite way but it's like they'll say a certain thing but then they say it uh, with a voice mode that has another implication to it and two of my favorite insults is when Irulan uh, roasts Edric she uses the voice mode for describing a machine saying, you have your uses apparently, uh, which was really funny because it's like, she's just like, yeah, you're fucking, you're just, you're just a machine. You're just here because you shield us, not because you're smarty pants or that you're really going to come up with any of this stuff. We're, you're just, you're just here to protect the plan, dude. You know, like you just shut up, like get out of here. And then uh, my other favorite was when Sightail roasts the Reverend Mother. And he's using a voice mode that says, you are not a sex object. You have never been a sex object. You cannot be a sex object, which is like, whoa, like really going for it there, dude. Like that's uh, that's pretty brutal. That's, that, that will like fucking piss that bitch off, like for sure. Uh, Cause it's like the Bene Gesserit, like that's the whole deal is like they have a huge breeding program. Like every Bene Gesserit, most Bene Gesserit uh, adepts and reverend mothers are have to participate they, in the breeding program uh, not a lot of them get to keep their kids some of them do but not all of them and my favorite thing about my final favorite thing about this chapter is how the Bene Gesserit are always talking uh, indirectly talking shit okay and they're always pointing out your failures on the down low you know they're always pointing some finger at you about what a fucking what a weak bitch you are you know like they always they always know your weaknesses and they and they point them out but in the most indiscreet or in the most discreet way possible earlier in the chapter Sightail notices that uh, the Bene Gesserit they're hosting on Wallach 9 uh, which is one of their planets they have many planets and early uh Sightail notices that they've built this glass dome they're in this glass dome uh, that was specifically built just for this meeting, and it was built because uh, the Lamo space fish Edric uh, feels will feel really uncomfortable and claustrophobic. He will feel claustrophobic nervousness if he is in an enclosed space because he's used to being uh, floating around in open space or some shit. It's not entirely clear, but it's like I guess that guy just like floats around in space or something or in water or something. Like he's not really someone who likes confined rooms and so they built this place um for him but it's just like it it just shows like like how weak he is it's like look we built this whole place for you because you're such a weak ass bitch that you can't even sit in a room you know it's like wow like what a veiled insult like it's so sick um and then also uh he, you know Sightail is like wondering what the Bene Gesserit have aimed at him you know, he's like, I know that th that's what they're, that's what they're, that's how they're fucking with Edric, but how are they trying to fuck with me? And he realizes at the end of the chapter that it's Irulan. Uh, Irulan is the, is the thing that they have here kind of for him to bum him out. And uh, who is a beautiful and intelligent female who can never be his, you know, um, which, yeah, that's, that's a bummer. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, but I love that his reaction is like, whatever. Maybe I'll just uh, copy her for another, you know, which essentially is like I've he's been around this bitch long enough to like mimic her really well. And so he could essentially turn himself into her and go fuck somebody else. So if he really, you know, it's, it's like that's, that's so messed up. Like that's so crazy uh, that he's just like, I, I, whatever, I'll just turn into her and go fuck somebody. I don't care. You know, like whatever. It was just like, oh, man, God, how fucking weird. What a weird existence. Um, so now let's get into our final chapter. Um, we finally, we finally get to see Paul Muad'Dib Atreides. Uh, the last time we saw our hero, he had just defeated the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV and had tasked his mother and his consort Cheney 
with negotiating his ascendancy to the throne. And it's been 12 years since then. Now Paul is in his early 30s. Um, I want to say he, it's again, it's not clear. It's a little vague. But I feel like he was 18 or 19 when we last left him. And so now, you know, it being 12 years later, he's probably 30, 31 maybe. I mean, maybe a little older. Um, but we see him in his bedchamber. He's stripping down after a nighttime walk around the city of Arakeen. He's been uh, disguised in a full still suit. Uh, you know, in the city, you don't necessarily, like, not everybody wears full still suits. Uh, it's like people just kind of go out and, like, pop back in, you know? So, but if, if you see someone in a full still suit, it's like they're wild Fremen. And people know to leave, like, the, the wild Fremen in the deserts who come from the deserts, leave them alone because they're crazy, you know? So he's got his face shielded, and he's kind of, like, trying to adjust himself. So, like, even people from his, his siege, when he lived in his siege, like, you know, trying to, they might not recognize him, although they might. Um, but he is, uh, he... He's been walking around the city at night by himself in a disguise. And uh, he, I love the line, watching mundane activities of, every li of everyday life filled him with profound envy. And, and also goes on to say, to walk down a street without attracting attention. What a privilege. What a privilege. You know, I mean, he goes out on these walks because... Uh, because it sucks to be the emperor, man. It sucks to be the man at the top. And uh, and this is such a beautiful way, I think, to reintroduce us to our hero. I mean, you have the most powerful man in the universe thirsting for just a little bit of normalcy, normalcy. Um, he's jealous of everyday nobodies and their mundane goings-ons. You know, he's just like, he's just like, oh, what I wouldn't give to just be a nobody and just like walk around and have my freedom and just be able to go up to somebody and talk to them and buy some water or whatever. And this is something that I think about a lot. Um, like, I I've thought a lot about like what sacrifices one has to make the more well known one becomes, you know, the more fame uh, that you have, the more personal sacrifice. Uh, goes along with it like I mean can you imagine being like an A-list celebrity um, like I don't know Jennifer Lawrence or whatever and um, it's like you could never go out without being bothered like ever again I mean you, you there's so many places that you just now you can't go because if you go you're going to cause such a fucking tiresome commotion and people are going to freak out and they're going to be like, oh, oh, take a picture with me. Oh, da, 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 da. Like all this stuff. Like, I mean, like these people, like Angelina Jolie can't just like run to Walgreens when she needs some tampons, you know, like what a bummer. Like in a, a lot of ways, it would just, it would suck in so many ways. It would suck in so many ways and you wouldn't be able to just do everything, everyday things anymore. And you'd have to have all these people doing these things for you. And I could see how that would be very annoying. I mean, it's like, maybe you just want to go to a restaurant and sit down, but like, you can't like, cause people are going to bother you and be like, Oh, I'm sorry. I know you're eating, but, uh, you know, it's, Oh, that would be a lot to deal with. Also makes it very lonely. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, Paul is very isolated. I mean, the more powerful you become, the more isolated you become and the more isolated you become, the more lonely you become. And so, you know, you see this man who's been, you know, at the very top of the pyramid for 12 years. I mean, he's like the most <laughs> isolated, the most powerful and the most isolated person. Um, and so we now have, we have Cheney and she enters the, their room with their coffee service. And this is the very same coffee service that he, he won or inherited when he slew uh, Jameis in the first book. And, uh, and I, I noticed how she's still making him coffee. I mean, even in the last book, she was making him coffee at one point and Jessica was like, she shouldn't be doing that. That's what, that's what a servant should be doing. You know, like, why is she making him like, that's not her job. Uh, because you know, Jessica would never have been making coffee for Duke Leto. Lady Jessica never made a coffee for Duke Leto ever. Like that was beneath her to do something like that. That was a servant's job. But, um, but the thing is, is like, I mean, Cheney is like, she's uh she's grounded as fuck you know she doesn't care like she uh she still she enjoys it she likes to serve him coffee like that's not a problem for her she doesn't see it as something that's like oh that makes puts you beneath people you know she's like uh no i'm just making coffee and it's fine and uh and also her personally serving him this coffee 
provides him with a bit of that normalcy that he craves so much, you know? I mean, it's just, it's a normal thing for a Fremen woman to make coffee for her dude, you know? And so she's kind of giving him a little bit of that normalcy that he wants so badly. Um, and uh, not only is she she pouring him the coffee, but she still orders his bath ass into bed. She's, get to bed, you know, you get in that bed. And he loves it. He's like, yes, ma'am. You know, like, oh, you know, and it's like, and that's another thing that I think is so cute is like someone, he's like, he's not interested in being, having power over everybody. Like, that's not what he wants. Like, it sucks. And so he has this, at least one person he can be a human being with, you know, because everybody else takes orders from him and he's above everyone else in the universe. But with her, he treats her as a peer, that they're on the same level, uh, even though they're not necessarily on the same level. Uh, and so I think that was, that was really beautiful. Um, but what he doesn't love is the poison snooper on his table, you know, snooping for poisons with its little insect arms, going over the nuts, you know, in the bowl. And uh, and it's just like that, it's like a, con like, even though he's like trying to just like be a human being for just a moment, his being a human being is interrupted by this stupid poison snooper and snooping for poisons. <laughs> he's just like, it's just like a constant reminder of the constant threat of danger to his person, you know, it's just so tiresome. Um, but the normalcy creeps back in when uh, Cheney starts massaging his legs before she initiates a difficult conversation with her man, which is uh, a very human thing that a lot of people do. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna ask somebody about something you know that they don't want to necessarily do. You want to butter them up a little bit. You wanna you want to make them feel good. You know you want to make them feel good before you ask for the thing they don't want to give you. You know maybe that'll help soften them up. And so she's massaging his legs, you know, which is like, I thought that was really cute. And she brings up Irulan's desire for a child. And, uh, and Paul is immediately like, no, <laughs> like, I am not putting a baby in that lady. Like, don't even start. And, uh, but Cheney brings up some good points. She's like, one, if you get her pregnant, um, that might, like, her, whoever is siding with her, like, our enemies who are working with her will now question her loyalty. Um, they might plus place less trust in her because um, they know that she would be a, a key player in all this. And they know that she is talking to other people. I mean, they're not stupid. They're not naive to the fact that, like, people are going to try to bring them down and she would be a part of it potentially. Um, and two, uh, and most importantly, she's like, you need an heir. House Atreides needs an heir and uh and i haven't gotten pregnant in 12 years i haven't been pregnant since our first child uh leto who was killed uh in the last book uh and so if you haven't seen me having your child in your oracular vision if you don't look in the future and you don't see me doing it well then Irulan is the be next best choice you know if it can't be me somebody's got to do it you know because you can't not have an heir and um and she's Cheney's been triggered because earlier in the day she had listened in on a conversation between Paul and Irulan when she returns from her conspiracy meeting on Wallach and they're in the family salon and Irulan comes to Paul and gives him was one last chance which by the way I love the evil odor hanging over this like that's so again space opera you know it's such like perfect uh, I love it uh so she's like, Irulan gives him one last chance. And she's like, look, let me have your baby. Okay, let me have your baby. And he's still like, nope. And she's like, fine, I'll go fuck somebody else and I'll get pregnant with their kid. And, you know, you'll, I'll dare you to expose me. And he's like, bitch, I would have you killed. <laughs> like, I would have you, I'm not, it's nothing personal, but I would have you killed. She's like, fuck. Uh, and he, I mean, she knows that he's not kidding. Like, he totally would. Um, and he's like, look, you can take a lover. I don't want to be cruel to you. Just do not bring a child in here. Like, I need to have control over this because he knows that if he puts a child in her, she is going to have influence over this child. The Bene Gesserit is going to have influence over this child. This child would mean that Chani uh, is now, like, her, she's even lower on the totem pole. She's no longer, you know, the... the uh, bearing the royal child and so she could be she could be killed now too because they don't want any competition um so uh so yeah so he but he's like no it doesn't matter and she's like well it's on your head then you know it's on your head and she essentially tells him like okay well you don't give me this well the conspiracy is a go you know like i'm not gonna i'm not i can't stop this then you know and so now we know that the conspiracy is on 
And Cheney senses this. I mean, she senses that uh, something has happened since Irulan has been to Wallach, and she tells Paul, you know, they've come to a decision on how to fight you, you know, and, and Irulan reeks of secret decisions. They can smell it on her. I mean, Paul can smell it on her. And, um, and so, you know, so she has this fear that, you know, they're going to take her man away. And she is so, you know, scared of this potential thing happening that she's willing to share her lover with another woman, which is a Fremen custom. They're, you know, within the Fremen society, there, there is a polygamy where men have several wives and somehow they make it work. Not always, it's not always friendly, but they make it work somehow. And, um, and I mean, Irulan is more beautiful than her. I mean, she's tall, this tall, icy, gorgeous blonde, you know, and she's like, look, man, like essentially what she's asking Paul to do is seduce Irulan. It's not just put a baby in her. She's saying, I want you to, to make love to this woman and mean it and seduce her, which will essentially potentially bring her over to our side, you know? But even though she doesn't really want that, she's willing, she sees that as a, as a she's willing to accept that uh, because she just cares about her man so much and doesn't want to see him hurt by anybody. And it just shows how she's so ride or die um, that she would be willing to, to make a personal sacrifice like that uh, for just so her man can not get fucked up by whoever's trying to fuck him up, you know? And it's no wonder that Paul loves her uh, so much. Like, it's like, geez, like, that's some, that's some real stuff there. And, um, and then, like, after this conversation uh, about the child, uh, we get into some real shit. And real shit that you may have missed. Uh, real shit that even Chani misses, Chaney misses. Um, so, uh, so, so, Sure, Irulan, you know, Irulan is, is reeking of, of secret decisions, but Paul makes his own secret decision between pages 44 and 45. Now, remember earlier on page 34 when Paul recites his grandfather's words, or recalls his grandfather's words to him, not the Baron, his, his, uh, his dad's dad. One who rules assumes irrevocable responsibility for the ruled. You are husbandmen. This demands, at times, a selfless act of love, which may only be amusing to those that you rule. And Paul has indeed uh, seen a way to end the jihad. The jihad is still raging, by the way. It's still going on. Um, I, don't know, I was reading somewhere, billions have died in his name. Somewhere upwards of 60 billion people uh, have died under, you know, in, in Paul Atreides' name. Um, and there's, it's just a lot of senseless religious butchery going on, and it really bums him out. And he knows that billions more are going to die unless he finds a way to, to quell this and to, to stop this jihad. And, uh, and the thing is, is, is he wants to save these billions of lives because they're his lives. He has, resumed, he has assumed responsibility for them when he became emperor. So now it is he that is going to have to make a selfless act of love and give in to a future timeline in which his beloved Cheney dies. Um, the only person who gives him any sense of normalcy, uh, any sense of comfort uh, in his nightmare of a life, you know, because it's like, yeah, Paul's at the top, but he's not enjoying it. He doesn't want to be there. He didn't want to have to do all this, but he had to because he was kind of chosen by fate. I mean, he even says I was chosen for this maybe even before I was born. I don't know. Um, and it's no wonder that he's super depressed. It's like he sees that the only way to end this jihad uh, is to give up the one he loves. And uh, it's, it's that real, like, the one or the many situation. And she's literally the only, the only person in his life that connects him to his humanity. Um, if it wasn't for her, he would just completely... <sighs> It would just, he, I don't think he could do it. I mean, I don't think he can do it without her. And, uh, and so it makes me, I, I, I get frustrated when I hear other readers uh, complain about Dune Messiah and complain about specifically Paul's character in this book uh, because he isn't this passionate, victorious leader that we met in the first book. You know, he's not... He's not that guy anymore. 
uh, that he's not the man that that all of us readers originally fell in love with. Uh, I was I was reading this one review, and a reviewer described him as being a self in a self pitying existential sulk with none of the sense of mission he had in Dune, you know, and that this that bummed this guy out, and so he was kind of booing down the thing. But I mean, it's just like, um, hello, hello, people. Uh, would you would you be in a good fucking mood uh, if you were stuck with the knowledge that you had to sacrifice the love of your life because all the other alternatives were even worse? Like, would you be in a great fucking mood? Would you feel like, yes, I'm gonna win this battle? Like, no, like it's like it's like choosing between which a rock and a hard place. You know, it's like there's he sees the the futures, all these possible future timelines, and all of them are fucking bleak. You know, it's like, let me guide myself into the least awful oblivion. You know, let me try to guide myself into the least awful oblivion that I can. Um, and he's going around, he's carrying this knowledge. He's keeping it to himself, which I'm sure is bumming him the fuck out. He doesn't have anyone he can talk to about it. And he's desperately trying to find a way around it. Uh, he's trying to find any way that he can to like have this not happen, even though the same things keep coming to him where it's like, this is the only way. Um, and so, you know, he's, uh, he's just trying to enjoy what time he has left with his most precious one. Um, he's just trying to, and it's, you know, there was this one moment where he's like, you know, I've, I've tarried or I've, you know, it's like, he's, he's just been kind of delaying it as much as he can because he knows that he's going to have to let her go and he just can't face it yet. And so he's just been like kind of letting things go on. Uh, Because he's not ready. He's not ready to make that sacrifice because he's going to be fucking, his heart's going to be fucking ripped out, you know? Um, And, you know, meanwhile, it's like billions are being slaughtered in his name. He's become some fucked up living god for a fucked up religious force. The greatest powers in the universe are working against him. Uh, He even meets resistance on Arrakis. Um, for his work of changing the ecological landscape. I mean, he, he, from the very population who asked for it, you know, the Fremen were like, oh, we want to make over the planet and we want more water and it's not going to be so shitty here. And so Paul has been slowly with his power as the emperor, like changing the ecological face, but he's found that he's meeting lots of human resistance and the more change happens, the more resistance he receives, again, from the very people who wanted this change, but they didn't really want the change. You know, he's, he, he's resented for it. I mean, the entire universe is fucking resenting Paul. You know, it's just like the entire universe. It's like a the entire Imperium is like a, a snotty, shitty teenager, you know, that he's like dad of. And like this dad is just trying his best to like keep a roof over everyone's head and keep everyone safe and like well fed and and hydrated. <laughs> and then like, and like, fuck you, dad. You know, it's just like, you don't understand me. And it's just like, oh, God, you know, like this poor fucking guy. I mean, he's he is. um. He's also trapped by his oracular vision. Uh, you know, like that's the thing, like the big problem with prophecy is that eventually like you're gonna, there's an end game here. You can't outrun death and eventually you're gonna be on this single track where you just see where it's all heading and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And you're trapped. I mean, like how awful would that be? I mean, you would, you would have no freedom anymore. Um, no sense of freedom. Uh, and that sucks. Nobody wants to feel caged like that. Nobody wants to be a caged bird. These these Atreides hawks need to fly, you know what I'm saying? Like, they don't want to be, nobody wants that. Um, and so, yeah, so he's just, he's under pressure on all sides. Uh, he is under pressure on all sides, and he's just, like, trying to keep everything together. He's trying to keep himself together. He's trying to keep this empire together. He's getting ready to sacrifice the love of his fucking life. Uh, but people are like, oh, he should be more exciting like he was in the first book. You know, it's just like, go fuck yourself. Like, you know, it's just like, it's just, it's just like, uh, it, it shows a real lack of empathy. You know, it shows a real lack of empathy for the character where people really don't put themselves in his shoes. You know, they really don't. They just want to, they just want to get the high that they got last time. You know, oh, he gave me such a high last time. I want another hit, you know, but it's like, this guy's out of hits for you, bro. I mean, he just did the biggest hit he could and that's not enough. Like, go fuck off. Um, so, yeah. Um, so now, so that's the end. That is the end of, uh, of our, our chapters. But I do want to discuss my three favorite quotes of wisdom that I found in our, in our chapters here. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in these books. There's a lot of wisdom in these books. And 
there's a lot of simple wisdoms. You know, he just sneaks in, Frank just sneaks them in there. And there's one on page 18. Uh, this is in the uh, chapter where the, the conspiracy is going on. And Edric is, is trying to kind of, he's fucking with Irulan, you know, trying to get her to become angry and, and fucking with her. And Sightail says, reason is the first victim of strong emotion to kind of get her to, like, not fall into his emotional trap. And, uh, and I thought that was really great. Reason is the first victim of strong emotion. It's very true. It's something that I contend with. It's something I try to, because I have a lot of very strong emotions. They can get away from me. And when you get really mad and shit, then you stop, you stop thinking. <laughs> the logic goes right out the window, man. Logic goes right out of the window when those strong emotions rear their, rear their heads. So I thought that was great. I liked that little, little you know, piece of wisdom. Then, on page 20, um, this one was really great. Saitail says, We of the Leiloxu believe that in all the universe there is only the insatiable appetite of matter. That energy is the only true solid. And energy learns. Hear me well, princess. Energy learns. This we call power. And I was like, Whoa! I really love this one um, because, you know, again, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot is just like, and, and we talked about this in the final episode of the Comic Book Girl 19 show, is that life is an act of consumption. You know, all energy, all matter is looking to consume more energy, you know, whether it's food, whether it's money, whether it's fame, you know, like whatever that energy is, like all life is looking to consume more energy so that it continued to grow and get as you know be as fat and happy as it can be you know i mean that's the that's the purpose of all growing things is to grow and live to its potential and that uh you know but energy learns you know this we call power so it's like people learn like oh if i do this i can get you know i can get energy you know and so that's what power really is is like power is whether it's a government whether it's an individual whether it's a religion whether it's uh, a fucking salesman on the side of the street, you know, everyone's looking for more energy. Uh, everyone is looking for more energy, and that is, and everyone wants power. That's what we're looking for. Um, so yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Timon, you like that one? I saw you raise your eyebrows at that one. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Finally, my my third favorite piece of wisdom uh, comes from page forty seven. And uh, a Bene Gesserit axiom slipped into his mind. To use raw power is to make yourself infinitely vulnerable to greater powers. Uh, and I was like, ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I like that. Um, energy learns isn't kind of vague. It's like, inner, no, that's, it's like, that's what power games are, you know? It's like... Anyways, uh, I mean, I guess it's kind of vague, but anyways, to use raw powers to make yourself infinitely vulnerable to greater powers, and um, I think that's a real truth of the universe. I mean, it's funny, like, uh, I was uh, within the within like like say for for instance, here's some woo woo shit. Say for instance, you are trying to uh, get into astral astral traveling. You're trying to project your consciousness onto a higher plane of consciousness the the next one up the astral plane and this is a real thing this is real things that people do and um but the thing is about that is when you start tapping into the astral plane it's like there are things within the astral plane that can fuck your shit up you know i mean it's like you have to kind of be aware of what you're doing and you there's things that you need to do to remain safe but like by by tapping into these powers you are making yourself vulnerable to greater powers that are out there um i mean that's something i think about when like using like a ouija board like let's 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 use that like okay so you're trying to talk to some spirit whatever and you're opening up this doorway well essentially you're making yourself vulnerable to whatever whoever is talking on the other side and you don't know what that is you know you do not know what that is uh, it could be anything it could tell you anything uh, and you are making yourself vulnerable to whatever it's saying. You know, you can't trust that shit. So, you know, that's that's some real some real stuff, you know. All these Doctor Strange problems. Yeah, these are Doctor Strange problems. But it's not just in the occult. I mean, this is like, I mean, this is everything. I mean, it's like Paul has made himself, you know, he's been using the raw power of his, you know, Kwisatz Haderach prescience oracular vision 
but it you know the oracular vision turns around and like fucks his shit up you know it's like oh yeah bitch well guess what you know here's some awful shit you know it's like oh fuck it sucks so um so yeah you know it's like that's that's some real some real stuff so okay guys let's take a short break and then we are going to come back for our second half we're going to be talking about questions <laughs> we got questions i'm going to take some questions from my patreon peeps first my team 19 members and then we'll open up to questions here on twitch so everyone take your take your bathroom breaks get your replenish your fluids stay hydrated fellas you gotta stay hydrated while you suffer I'm all about water, guys. I'm really, like, seriously, you should drink water. Uh, so, yeah. So, I'll be right back. See you in a minute. Mm -hmm. 